Thanks for checking out this movie review video. So I just did a review for The Shining that's already available on my channel, so check that out. So it's only fitting that I then do a review for Dr. Sleep, which was released in 2019. Now I will say up front, I am, if you already watched my, my Shining review video, you'll know this. I'm a huge fan of the Stanley Kubrick, The Shining. Uh, it's one of my favorite films, not just of horror, but favorite films in general. And I love, 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 love it. So partially for that reason, I did quite like Dr. Sleep, but I didn't like it as much as I wanted to. And I think it's for a few reasons. For one, um, I wanted to really love it, but I think part of what kept me from super, super loving it was my love of the Shining film. Um, it's just weird when you take something like that that you love so much and you expand upon that universe. It's just going to feel odd because I've seen that movie a lot of times and literally I just watched that movie again the same day that I watched Dr. Sleep. So that's kind of a weird thing. The other thing is I haven't read the books. So I didn't read The Shining book and I didn't read Dr. Sleep by Stephen King, which obviously that's what these movies are based on. But um, from what I understand, uh, Mike Flanagan, the, the man who wrote the script for, for Dr. Sleep and directed it, was really trying to reconcile differences that there were between The Shining book and The Shining movie by Kubrick. Uh, because that's been a long-standing thing, if people don't know, where, you know, there there's this grouping of people who are like, the book is so much better, and there's a grouping of people who are like, the movie's so much better, and apparently they're very, very different. And for that reason, you know, Stephen King hated Kubrick's The Shining. So what Flanagan was looking to do was to kind of bring everyone together and produce a sequel that could kind of reconcile all the differences between the two, between the book and the movie, and kind of um, roll that into an actual sequel that works for both of them. So I think, first of all, that's an awesome way to do things. That's a cool way of kind of bringing some semi-divided horror groups back together. Um, so I think that's cool. But I haven't read the book, so I don't know what the differences were. I don't know what, what, what was reconciled in it. So I think for that reason, I don't necessarily appreciate the film as much as I could. Um, but like I said, I still quite liked it. One of the other things is, in general, I felt like it was a bit slower than I wanted it to be. The pacing was relatively slow. Um, and I think that The Shining is kind of slow at times, but the um, the Overlook Hotel looks so interesting and, and big and grandiose that you get kind of lost in looking around at it. There's so much to look at. And this film didn't really have that when there were the slower times, so it was a little different. For that reason, that slower pacing kind of felt slower, um, and I didn't like that as much, but... So anyway, like I said, you know, Mike Flanagan wrote the script for this and directed it, obviously based off the Stephen King book, Dr. Sleep. Uh, other things Mike Flanagan's done, if people are not familiar, he did the film Oculus, which looked, I saw it, it looked great. I didn't really like the film. He did Gerald's Game, uh, also looked great. I actually really liked the film. A lot of people don't make it through that. So many people I know were like, I gave up at the 20 minute mark. And I'm like, you've got to see it through. There's a payoff. Um, and I feel like Dr. Sleep is kind of that way too. Like, um, like I was saying, like it was a little bit slow at times, but the whole thing felt like the build up to the very end for the payoff. Um, he also did Haunting of Hill House, which is on Netflix, which I think is phenomenal. Uh, that does have a slower pacing to it, but it's, um, it works within the story that he was doing. And once again, looks amazing. I think Mike Flanagan as a director is outstanding. His script writing is usually really, really good. So, uh, I'm a fan. I quite like him. So obviously this stars Ewan McGregor, he's the biggest name in it. Uh, he was in um, Shallow Grave, which if people have not seen Shallow Grave before, definitely check that out. That is a good film, it's kind of a hidden gem. Uh, Train Spotting, obviously everyone knows him from, I love Train Spotting. I haven't seen the second one, but I will at some point. And Night Watch, which is also a good one, if people have not seen Night Watch, check that out as well. So the film had a $45 million budget, and it actually ended up making $72.3 million, so... A net positive. They they did well. They made money. Um, apparently, the studio, when they finally got funding for Doctor Sleep, they were actually also looking to make a prequel called Overlook Hotel. So, I don't know. I feel like if the right person handles something like that, I could be open to a prequel to The Shining. But, you know, I just don't know that you need that. I feel like it might take too much away because... In The Shining, you just kind of hear the stories of 
of how Overlook Hotel became the way it did. You know, it was initially on a Native American burial ground, and they moved the burial ground to put the the hotel there. And then there was, you know, the um, the axe murders that they talk about by Delbert Grady and all that kind of stuff. So it, it's kind of better to hear those things as opposed to see them because then you kind of see them in flashes throughout The Shining. So I, I just don't know if we need a prequel. But if it's done by the right person and it's done well, I'd be open to it. Um, they use very recognizable music when they get started with this. Oh, real quick, I will say, um, I usually, with newer movies like this, I usually don't do spoilers, but for this one, I am going to do spoilers because since I did the Shining review, and that was obviously spoilers because it's an older film, I feel like it's only appropriate that I do spoilers for this as like a companion piece to the Shining one. So there will be spoilers. If you haven't seen Dr. Sleep yet, stop this video, watch it, then come back to it and... You know, you'll hear what I have to say about it, but I do recommend watching it. So anyway, excuse me. They use extremely recognizable music in the very beginning of this, and it made me smile. Uh, it's the same music that's in the beginning of The Shining. I love that that type of connection. And there are actually a lot of those moments in the film where it's like the nostalgia for people who love the, the, uh, the Shining film, where, um, you know, you'll see things that are super recognizable, and I'll kind of bring those up as I go through my notes because there were quite a few that I recognized. And I think some of them have a big significance. Well, a bigger significance than you might realize. And that's just me, you know, guessing. The reshoots that they did of stuff from The Shining, I think, look really good. Like, in the beginning, the first one you see is when um, Danny Torrance is riding on the big wheel through the hotel. Uh, at first, you can't even tell, necessarily, that it's a reshoot. It just looks... It looks crisper and more bright because it, you know, it's a newer film. But it, um, until the Danny kind of turns his head a little bit and looks at the door for two thirty-seven, you don't realize that it's not the original actor, Danny Lloyd. You, um, you think that oh, maybe they just like took this and like super cleaned it up. It's the same footage. Like it looks the same, basically, until you see that. And then you get a bunch of stuff that they kind of reshot, which I think works well. And one of my f favorite things about the reshoots was the fact that they recast the character of Wendy um, with a much better actress. Because I, you know, if you go back and watch my review for The Shining, I talk about why I didn't like Shelley Duvall's performance. But I also talk about why I believe her performance may not have been good. It may not have all been her fault. A lot of it may have come down to Stanley Kubrick and the way he treated her on the set. But anyway, um, so one of the, the moments I really liked in this is when Halloran, like it shows the flashback of when, uh, Wendy and Danny had gotten away from the overlook and left that behind. They moved down to Florida and Danny is still seeing Halloran, Dick Halloran, uh, as like a ghost who comes and, you know, kind of mentors him, talks to him about the shining still. And I really liked the moment where he was kind of explaining things a little bit. And that's where we got that nice little nugget of knowledge about his level, Danny's level of The Shining being like a super battery for the Overlook Hotel. And so once he got into that hotel, things got out of control and it was feeding off his uh, Shining energy that just amplified everything. So in my Shining review, I had a theory about how I thought maybe Jack Torrance had The Shining as well because it seemed to be a familial thing since Dick Halloran had talked about, I think, his grandmother having it as well. But now that seeing Dr. Sleep, it makes me think that, you know, according to this film, Dr. Sleep, that um, that wasn't actually the case. The case was actually just that people who didn't have The Shining were able to see what was going on, like The Shining that the Overlook Hotel was giving off because it was crazy amplified because it had never reached that type of level but it did then because of Danny, because Danny just amplified the hell out of it. And yeah, so I like that explanation. I think it works really well. And I, I was satisfied with that. As a, as a big fan of The Shining, I was satisfied with that. I did like it. Uh, Danny has, the, it becomes obvious in this that Danny has the same, I'll, I'll just, I'm just going to keep calling him Danny, by the way. He goes by Dan because he wants to kind of, I mean, that's a, a, a intentional choice in the script because he's trying to feel like he's a different person by changing his name to Dan as opposed to Danny that distanced himself from his childhood, from all the trauma, and from being the person that he was back then. 
and the person that his father called him, because a lot of this is about him distancing himself from who his father was. Uh, but you see in the film that there's the same darkness, and they kind of talk about this, the same darkness that was in Jack Torrance is in Danny Torrance, and that manifests mainly in the film, at least early on, with the drug use, the alcohol, and all that type of stuff. But it's kind of a dual purpose for him. I feel like the, the substance abuse for Danny in the film is a combination of him, uh, you know, already having that um, that addiction uh, predisposition because of the genetics from his father and it just being passed down by his father. But also I view it as that's his way of trying to um, bring things in check with his shining. I feel like that's kind of a way he he dampens the shining for himself and tries to control it and tries to kind of forget it because you see that he's, he's intentionally trying to not deal with things. And that's seen with when he keeps going into doors, um, those moments of like his shining where he's in his head going through doors and it's that the bathroom in room 237 at the overlook and he's running away from it, basically not confronting it. And that's one of the big things like while, while he's abusing substances, he's, intentionally avoiding the stuff that he needs to deal with in his life, which is getting a handle on The Shining, um, getting a handle on the trauma that he that he experienced, um, coming to terms with who his father was and what the, his relationship with his father did to him. You know, he needed to confront and deal with things, and he just kept running away from it, which, you know, obviously in the film he eventually does deal with it, but it, you know, takes some time. Early on, I'm not sure I really like the concept of this kind of soul vampire because, I mean, basically that's what it is. Like, Rose the Hat and her whole group, they're, they're soul vampires, basically. You know, they're sucking the souls out of people who also have The Shining um, so that they can continue to stay young. Uh, they're not immortal, but, you know, there's a very specific difference made there. You know, not immortal, but they can keep themselves younger by doing this. And, um... Uh, Grandpa Fleck, I think is his name, is obviously the one that's been uh, around for a long, long time and has kind of taught people as, a, as they go. But when the idea was was introduced, I just don't think, I don't know, because I feel like vampires are so overdone and this is just a different version of vampirism. And I was just like, eh, I, don't, I just don't know that I really like it. And I went back and forth as I was watching the film, and I think at the end, I still don't really like it that much, but I think it's it's okay. It's, it's kind of where I landed by the end of the film. I'm like, it's okay. I would I would have liked if they had developed the uh, Rose the Hat and her, you know, actually, I don't even think she needed a group. I, I actually would have preferred it if it was just Rose the Hat as the bad guy coming after people. Um, that would have been more more what I would have liked, but uh, you know, a lot of people like the way this, that they structured it and that's fine. It's just the soul vampire thing for me. I don't know. Just not a fan. Uh, so the office of the guy, this is, this is one of those kind of more subtle ish things, except for people who are big fans of the shining or just watched it or both. Uh, the, when Danny starts going to the, uh, Alcoholics Anonymous meetings and he meets with the head of it the very first time in his office, the office is set up exactly the same as the office at the Overlook Hotel that Jack Torrance goes to in The Shining for his job interview. So I thought that was a cool connection. And I think it's, it, was, it wasn't just intentional from the standpoint of, oh, we want to give this kind of nod of, do people who like The Shining notice this? Uh, I think it was very intentional because when Jack Torrance goes into that office and he gets the job, that's a turning, a very large turning point in his life. That is the moment that he steps into a place that will take hold of him and make him super evil and make him do terrible things. Now, on the other hand, when Danny Torrance walks into the office at the AA meeting and it's set up exactly the same, that is also a turning point in his life where he stops running, he stops denying um, what The Shining is and how he should be working with it, and he basically goes from rock bottom and starts going upwards. So it's these polar opposites, and they're both signaled by being in that office and making a commitment. So I thought that was really, really cool. Um, sorry, I lost my notes because it shut down on me. I walked, I talked so long. So there's a really good quote that actually comes out of that meeting portion in the office that they, uh, after the AA meeting 
where uh, Danny says, our beliefs don't make us better people, our actions do. I thought this was an amazing quote, and it's something that I think really applies to, to real life. Because how many times have you met people who say, oh, I'm all about this, I believe in this, I do this, and then their actions say something totally different? That's that type, type of quote, kind of to say, you know, you say you're all about this, but don't be a hypocrite. I'm not going to look for the words you're you're selling to me. I'm going to look for the actions that come after those words. And that's the type of person I am in real life. I don't trust people until they show me that what they're saying is what I'm getting. So, and I think that everyone should kind of, you know, live that way. But great, great, great quote. So I like when you find out what Dr. Sleep actually means. I think that's a really cool thing. This is the moment where he starts to really realize that the shining that he's viewed as like a terrible burden, like he even said that one of the very traumatizing things is he would see the flies starting to buzz around people because of the shining, and that would make him realize that they're going to die. So it traumatized him because he saw it with his mother, and then he didn't want to see it, and that's when he really turned away from having anything to do with it. And then when he gets this job, he's sober, he starts going back to it and realizes this is something I can actually use to help people. And that's where he starts helping people transition into death, which is a really cool moment. Plus, I love cats, so I like the fact that the cat was involved too. Uh, and that's an actual thing, by the way. There is a uh, nursing home. I saw an, a, um, I don't, I don't know where exactly it is, but it was a few years ago I saw it on the news. There was a nursing home, and they have a cat, and the cat keeps showing up into in the rooms of the people who are about to pass within a day or two. So I thought that was interesting that they wrapped that into it. But um, yeah, I love when they reveal what Dr. Sleep means. I think it's cool uh, and it's touching. And, it, and it's, a, it's a jumping off point for Danny to really start to realize that there's good in, in how he can use The Shining. So at this point, I already saw this coming because obviously this happens big time in the very end. It becomes very clear that Abra, the character of Abra, becomes the new Danny, and Danny becomes the new Halloran. Um, and this is foreshadowing kind of early on as, as the relationship starts to spawn between Danny and Abra through the chalkboard in his uh, apartment or Airbnb or where, wherever he's living. I guess it's an apartment. But he, um, you know, he's forging that relationship, much like uh, Halloran did with him early on in The Shining and is trying to become his mentor then. But the big difference is he was shutting him out. He was really trying to shut him out. He accepted him, accepted him as kind of a friend, but he didn't accept him as a mentor having to do with The Shining. Whereas Abra was very open to it. It's like she was reaching out and looking for a mentor, which is totally opposite of Danny. Danny was kind of like pushing it away. And by the end, you know, he makes the turn and he listens to kind of what Halloran said to him and you know he he connects with Abra he helps her out even though he was reluctant in the beginning and he teaches her the best way to use the shining and kind of cultivates that in her and the problem with Danny all along is that he kept refusing the help he didn't want to recognize what good he could do with the shining and how best to deal with it he just didn't want to have anything to do with it. And that's why things in his life ended up going so poorly after the Overlook Hotel. Until he got a hold of it. Which I think was good. Um, so it seems that Rose, uh, the part where they realize what ability Abra has, and there's the idea of, well, why don't we bring her into our group? And Rose is like, oh no, she's you know too powerful. For me, it seems more like she's saying that because she realizes that if Abra became a part of the group, she would not become the alpha in that group anymore because Abra is so powerful that she would be the most powerful and then by by default become the alpha of the group. And Rose obviously does not want to miss that. or She doesn't want to give that up because she's obviously the one who leads everything and calls all the shots and she likes the power, you can tell. I like the concept of the souls from the Overlook coming for Danny. And the coping strategy that he has in his mind of locking them in those boxes. Obviously that comes into play big time at the end where he just unlocks them all and lets them loose. That's a cool moment. I really like that. But I think it's it's not easy to come up with a concept like that. And I'm assuming that was in the Doctor Sleep book uh, that Stephen King came up with that. It always you know blows my mind how 
creative Stephen King is and has been throughout his entire life. Like, his creativity is crazy. And when he makes these, he comes up with these worlds and he comes up with these concepts and abilities and stuff like this. And it's it's just awe-inspiring to me because I'm a creative person and I have creative thoughts. But I feel like his creativity is just beyond, like, so far beyond. And I respect that. It's cool. Uh, I think it's an amazing moment in this film, probably my favorite segment of the film, when Abra catches Rose in her mind and flips the table. Uh, that was outstanding. I didn't see it coming. And there are a few moments like that where it's kind of like the double cross going on or someone gets the drop on someone and then you realize, oh no, it's actually the opposite because they you know, put other things in place, precautionary measures to... Um, to get the drop on him when they thought that they were getting the drop on him. Yeah, those moments were really cool. And that moment where, where Rose is caught in Abra's mind is pretty awesome. They did that really well. I did not see a gunfight coming in this film. I thought for sure nothing like that would ever happen. It really caught me off guard. I mean, it worked in the film for you know where the story was going, but I just never assumed there would ever be a firefight in it. It was weird. So I like the aim that they took of leading Rose to the Overlook because she has no idea what it is. She has no concept of it. She's not aware of it at, at all, which means she would be in more danger than uh, Abra and Danny when they're walking into it. And then obviously Danny at that point knows that, you know, he makes the hotel stronger and that he could try and sway things a little bit because he has more control over the Shining at that point that he could kind of use it as a weapon against Rose. And I really like that concept. I thought that was cool. Um, the gas station, by the way, when they're going to the Overlook, the gas station they stop at before they go on their last little leg of the trip to get to the Overlook, that's the exact same gas station that Dick Halloran stopped at and got the snowcat when he was on his way to try and save um, the Torrance family. So I really, I perked up at that moment too. I was like, that's the same gas station. Awesome. So Danny walking into the rundown Overlook Hotel is awesome, awesome nostalgia. I Yeah, I love that whole sequence. But it wasn't just for, here's nostalgia for everyone who likes The Shining. It, seemed, it, it was also, he was walking in the footsteps of his father. And that was kind of a way of him confronting his past, confronting the trauma, dealing with it finally. When in the beginning of the film, he spent so much time running from it and not intentionally not dealing with it. And it was killing him, obviously, because he was doing drugs, he was drinking, he was killing himself inside because of the trauma that he wasn't dealing with. So I loved him going through the, the totally dilapidated overlook for that reason. It was so good. It was meaningful, and it looked great. The low-level wind sound throughout the hotel adds a lot to the scenes when he's in it. If you notice, I mean, you might not notice because you're focusing so much on what's going on and the dialogue that happens, especially in the gold room at the bar, but there's a low-level wind sound that's going through the hotel, and it adds it adds a lot to it. It makes it a little bit creepy. It made, makes it a little bit, I don't know, it just it has an awesome ambiance that it increases. So Jack Torrance being the bartender is a really cool moment. I really did enjoy that. Um that moment is truly the pinnacle of Dan, uh, Danny actually confronting his past and the father's darkness and overcoming it because he, you know, knocks the booze away when he's being offered it. That's his final kind of temptation uh, by, you know, the ghost of his father trying to say, follow my path. You're here now. This is your moment to do what I did to be me. And he obviously chooses the opposite. I also think it was cool that they made... Um, that they made Jack the bartender, because if you remember in The Shining, Delbert Grady was the caretaker that had axed his family, and they talk about all those years ago. And when you see his, um, when you see his ghost in the Overlook Hotel, when Jack comes across him in the bathroom, because you know he spilled the drink on him, he's like, "Oh, let me clean you up." He's basically like a like a bathroom attendant slash bartender, I guess, and he doesn't remember who he was. And it's the same in Dr. Sleep. You know, Jack Torrance was the caretaker, but now he shows up as a ghost as the bartender. So instead of trying to um, 
control the property as a caretaker. He is controlled by the property as a servant, as a bartender. And that's exactly what happened with Delbert Grady too, because he was in that caretaker position, and then he's a servant of the hotel when Jack comes across him as a ghost. So I thought it was cool that they kind of did the same thing in that sense. That's And that's the thing, like these, these little touches that you won't necessarily pick up on unless you're, you know, kind of deep into The Shining are really cool. And like I said, that that's a really good one. So the Snowy Maze Showdown, first of all, looks very much like The Shining. So awesome, because that still looks amazing. And I just thought it was cool. I thought the way that it played out was very nice. Um, it looked amazing. It looked great. And I kind of, you know, I didn't know where they were going to go with it. I just really didn't. Uh, that scene recreating Jack and Wendy on the stairs is really cool as well. You know, it's, um, you know, Danny backing up on those same stairs where Wendy had been backing up and Rose, instead of it being Jack coming at him, it's Rose coming at him. So that's kind of a throwback to this moment of peril where they, um, yeah, they just mirror it from The Shining, and I thought it was super, super cool. So Danny, be uh, yeah, and then I wrote down, truly in the end, Danny becomes Halloran and Abra becomes Danny because, but different. Because, you know, as we all know, in The Shining, Halloran was coming to save Danny. And Danny actually is able to save Abra. So it's what the intent was with Halloran going to save Danny but he gets act like axed like as soon as he gets to the Overlook Hotel, which b always bothered me. Um, so I like that it's kind of set right in a sense in Doctor Sleep, um, because you know Danny goes into it and kind of realizes that you know I got to give it my all. I may be giving my life, but I'm going to protect Abra because it's basically like him protecting the younger himself, you know, and um, you know righting the wrongs of the past in a sense by doing that doing what Halloran was trying to do, but succeeding at it. Halloran died, but he didn't achieve what he was trying to do before he died. Um, Abra makes the opposite choice of what Danny did. Uh, Danny finally listened to Halloran, what Halloran said, and passed it on to Abra. I'd kind of talked about that before, about how, you know, Danny was kind of pushing away Halloran's uh, advice, and then he accepts it eventually and passes everything on to Abra like he's supposed to. So in the very, very end, when Abra goes into the bathroom, uh, I think that that indicates her choice of totally accepting her situation and accepting her shining and showing um, not mastery of it, but control over it. Because in the very beginning, we see Danny all the time going into those rooms, and it's the it's the bathroom in room 237. And he's trying to run away with it, or won't run away with it, run away from it. Well, in the end, Abra is going into a bathroom confidently, and that's the showing of the juxtaposition between where Danny was in the beginning and where she is at the end, and her making the exact opposite choice of what Danny was making. She's running full force, headlong into head, uh, headstrong into it, saying, I'm accepting this when he was running away from it. So I thought that was a cool thing. And then just a few things to wrap it up at the end. Uh, I feel like this film speaks to the trauma passed to children from their flawed parents who don't deal with their issues well. Obviously, that's very strongly seen in The Shining and carrying over to Dr. Sleep with how terrible Jack Torrance is. And also, to a degree, how terrible Wendy was in just letting things happen um, and not getting her son out of there because she was very clearly in denial. And we know that because of the way she explains away the physical abuse that happened to Danny Torrance with, you know, uh, Jack grabbing him and yanking his arm and hurting his arm. So, uh, and then the final thing I had down was Danny connecting to his father through drink speaks to the unhealthy relationships people have with their flawed parents just because they're their parents. Obviously, Jack tried to kill Danny at one point, so he doesn't want to have like a real relationship with him after the fact. But um, he also can't help it. it and it kind of speaks to that issue of family is family and you end up having these very unhealthy relationships because you feel like you have to have relationships with your parents and with family members in general. So you fall into these very unhealthy relationships. And that's how I kind of viewed in the film him being, you know, jumping into the alcohol and basically living like his father did. So, 
Uh, good film. I did like it. Uh, it's obviously not going to hit as high as my rating for The Shining. Um, if you didn't see my review, I gave The Shining five stars. I love, love, love that film. It's amazing. But I will say, you know, Mike Flanagan did a really good job with this. Uh, I really would like to read the books at some point to see, you know, what he did reconcile between the, the Shining book and the Shining movie. One day, one day, because those are long books. But, um, yeah, I mean, it looks really good. I expected that from Mike Flanagan. He's a very good director. Uh, the music was really well done. The acting was really good. I mean, so many aspects of it, awesome. Um, it's just story-wise, like, I wasn't really feeling the whole soul vampire thing, and it did get kind of slow, like I said. So, um, with five stars in play, uh, out of five stars with half stars in play, I'm going to give it four stars. I think it deserves a four star. That's good. I'm down with it. Um, yeah, I liked it. So now's the time where I ask people, comment down there. Tell me your thoughts on Dr. Sleep. Tell me your thoughts on the connection between The Shining and Dr. Sleep. I'm very interested in that if you have thoughts on it. Um, also, if you, you know, think I'm off on some of the stuff I said in this or you agree with it, you know, go ahead and let me know. And do me a quick favor, hit that subscribe if you're not already subscribed because that's how I keep encouraged because I'm not making money doing this or anything. It's just a hobby. Um, so encourage me with a subscribe. And if you've already subscribed, encourage me with a thumbs up and let me know you're still watching. But thanks everyone for checking this out. And until next time, keep it brutal.